all you art fans out there. Uh, I'm going to redefine again to you what art movements are, the, the definition of art movements. Uh, we did this last week, but I think it's good to revisit that. Uh, art movements are nothing more than the definition of styles of art with specific philosophies, specific techniques, and goals. In other words, um, there was a different meaning to Jackson Pollock's work than there was to Rembrandt. So that's the reason these things got defined. Art movements reflect the times of their cultures. And art movements span about 5,000 years. They help us reflect on where we have been and perhaps where we're going. And they help us to understand ourselves better because they are a visual history of what we have done and what we perhaps may do. Today, we're going to cover the Renaissances and we won't cover all of the Renaissance, but we'll get a good dig into it. Uh, you notice that I said Renaissances, Renaissances being plural. This covers the time from about 1400 to 1600. There was a fellow by the name of Giorgio, and all of these names today, 85% of them will be Italian. So there are lots of fun to say, uh, as most Italian is. Uh, Giorgio Vasari was around in the 1500s, from 1511 to 1574. During that time, he wrote the first art history book. And because it was the first, a lot of people reference it. But it wasn't complete, nor was it even really correct. It was called The Lives of the Most Excellent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects of that period of time. He was the first one to coin the word, excuse me, Renaissance. Renaissance in Italian means nothing more than rebirth. And the Renaissance was really not a rebirth, but it was a beginning. Uh, the, and there were lots of Renaissances, as I said earlier. There's the Northern Renaissance, the Italian Renaissance, the early Renaissance, the high Renaissance. But all of this went on between 14 and 1600. That's about 700 years ago. This is one rendition, uh, this is an artist's rendition of Florence at the time. And we have another slide, which I would like to, dim. there we are. This is the modern Florence that you're looking at now. But the modern Florence, of course, it's grown and changed in 700 years, but you notice that Duomo or the dome is still there and still just the way they finished it during the Renaissance. And we'll get to more about that later, which is interesting. This is where the Renaissance began. And as I said, Vasari was sort of the jingleist for uh, the Italian Renaissance. And uh, you're wondering, well, how did all of this get started? Well, it's very interesting the way this got started because it got started because tradesmen needed to travel to sell their fabrics, their wares, whatever they were selling, what was, whatever was needed. But they couldn't travel safely. So they needed letters of credit. And that's 
where the Medici family comes in. The Medici family were the first bankers. That was the, the first bank. And they were a little family, a, a family that came from a little village uh, near Florence. And they moved into Florence. This happens to be a slide of Cosimo Medici, who was the Duke of Florence. The Medici family were, because they were the most powerful bankers uh, and moneylenders at the time, they also had, they became partners with the Catholic Church. So the Medici family had five popes that were from the, Med from the Medici. And these popes, of course, were connected to the bank, which was connected to the church, which was the neck bone connected to the elbow bone, blah, 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 okay? Um, however, when all this money was being made, remember, as I, we talked about last, the last program, people were beginning to build rooms, the churches, needed art. And at this time, a lot, a lot of Catholic churches were being built because again, the Medici were, were friends uh, with the Catholic church and the Catholic church were friends with the Medici. So they were working together to build beautiful environments that would draw people in the art being done by the Catholic Church, remember, were pictures of Mary and uh, Jesus and the popes were often painted into the paintings, of course, because they were paying for the paintings. And uh, the stories of these saints and of Jesus and John the Baptist and the apostles were all being painted at this time. The, the painting was really a tool of the church because remember, there were no books yet. Uh, people didn't read. So this, we showed it to them in pictures. Um, so the first, artists we're going to talk about today, because this is an art show, uh, I'm not going to talk about the politics of it or whatever else, because I'm really not qualified to do that, since I'm only a painter. Um, but we're going to talk about the artists mainly, and what, how, how an artist, how the artists felt about what they did, which is really interesting. We're going to talk first about Michelangelo. So there he is, the poor little thing. Uh, Mark, Michelangelo was an interesting character. He began his art career very, very young. Even before he was 10 years old, he was out in the quarries. He had a relative who was a sculptor as well. And he was out in the quarries. It interested him, chipping away at the rock. Michael, or Mico, as he said in uh, Italian, called him Italian, he was only five feet, two inches tall. He was a little fellow. And he was said to be very cranky. He would not own up to being an artist. He shunned being a painter. I can't blame him. And he looked down upon the job that the Pope was forcing upon him to paint this Sistine Chapel ceiling. Uh, Miko considered himself much more of a sculptor than an, than an artist. And he, of course, worked in a studio. 
And at this point, I'm gonna stop and tell you all about how studios work then. <clears throat> Today, I can sit down with this easel and I have everything I need to do a painting. But that's not true then. Then there were no canvases all prepared. There were no paints and tubes, the yada, da, yada, yada, no brushes even. So painting was done in studios and studios could contain it, it, however many people they needed for a project at, at the time. Um, they, um, and many of the artisans became journeymen, uh, commissioned work, contractors. That's where all these words began to come into our um, understanding. And these were, these created new jobs. It took a lot, a lot of workers to do the Sistine Chapel. And remember the Sistine Chapel was done with tempera. It was not done with oil paints. Now, if you take a look at this, the, the ceiling, uh, of the Sistine Chapel, as, you, as you're seeing it right now, only the, the fresco has to be painted into damp plaster. It's base, basically um, uh, egg and water mixed in with pigment. That's just the basic recipe. And it has to be, has to be, painted into damp plaster, because as the plaster dries, and this is a better uh, photograph of it up here, as that plaster dries, it becomes permanent. But you can see the shadowing, the color, all of it is muted and rather elementary. And it took lots and lots of workers to do this. As you can imagine, if you look at the size of the ceiling, but however they, they did it, the, it, even if uh, artisans painted the backgrounds for him, the, the finishing, the finished work had to be done by the master. And it had to be done while the plaster was damp. So this means that he could only do a couple of square feet a day, if that, depending upon what was happening. So that's how that chapel, a ceiling got made. And believe me, it was a, a hero's endeavor. It, I mean, it, it's astonishing that they were able to even do it. Didn't they paint on their backs? They did. He laid on his back. He complained bitterly uh, to doctors. To, he complained to anyone who would listen, essentially. He was a curmudgeon. Yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, <clears throat> did, did paint drop in his face? I'm sure that it did. And I'm sure that some of, imagine laying up there painting with something that's made up of egg and it's hot and the egg is spoiling and it's starting to stink <laughs> well this was not pleasant so i don't blame him for cranking about it frankly okay the next slide we're going to look at is leonardo my friend leonardo da vinci Oh, that Leonardo. Oh, oh, no, 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 that's, well, that's okay, though. That's, that's, that's another one of Michelangelo's little numbers. This he, he enjoyed doing. Okay, now we're to Leonardo. Leonardo was an enigma. Nobody really knew what was going on with this guy, because he was going six ways from Sunday, as everyone knows. Uh, 
And he also invented the thing that we are all a circle. And you know, you've seen many drawings where it's a square and then in the circle, the guy has his legs out and his arms out like this. And if you lay like that and you draw around or have someone draw around you, it in truth, no matter what height you are, you come out a circle. And that was a, a, a really, if you think about it, a really interesting discovery. Uh, also, it was the basis of all things because we know now that there are no straight lines in nature. There aren't any. Uh, you hear people say, I, I hear people, a lot of people say to me, oh my gosh, I can't draw, I can't even draw a straight line. But that's okay because there are no straight lines. And the best thing you can learn is to learn not to look at straight lines, to look at everything in terms of light. But that's another, another day, another story. Interestingly enough, the Last Supper that Leonardo painted was, as everyone knows, this is the most famous painting in the world. There's nothing any more popular than this painting. I'm not saying it's the best painting in the world. I'm saying it's the most popular painting in the world. Even, even more than the Mona Lisa? Oh, yes. Even more. Oh, easily more, more popular than the Mona Lisa. Uh, okay. uh, it, it's, and however, there, it, the Last Supper was fraught with problems from the very beginning in that the priests who uh, commissioned Leonardo to do this painting were of course complaining that he was not painting fast enough. Believe me, I know, I've heard that before. And uh, they wanted him to speed it up. And he said to the priest, I can't paint any faster because I'm looking for a paint by to serve as Judas's face. He couldn't find anyone that he thought was suitable enough or sinister enough looking to use as a paint by for Judas's face. So the, the uh, priest kept bugging on him. So finally he said to Leonardo, uh, finally Leonardo said to the priest, he said, look, if you don't stop bugging me, I'll use your face as Judas. <laughs> so that, you know, artists have their ways. Um, there were no, first of all, now here are the things, just listen to this. Here are the things that face that painting. First of all, the priests were in a big hurry to get this church built, right? So they had the builders fill the walls with junk uh, from the countryside and it was wet. So the, the stuff that was inside of the walls was wet. So, of course, this caused issues with the wall that the Last Supper was painted on. They called it a fresco, but it was really not a fresco because Leonardo wanted to exper experiment with different kinds of paints. So he used some linseed oil and some tempera and some this and some of that. And as, as you would know, that oil and water Water just do not mix and you can't do that at all and you still can't do it okay uh, and so this painting I added this up this painting has been being restored or worked on 60 years after its first completion they started restoring this painting 60 years after they completed restoring the Last Supper to its original, what they think it looked like 
1999. This means they have been working on this single painting for 441 years. So, I mean, maybe the priests were right. I mean, that's a long time. But they have been working on it, and now they feel that they have the right painting up there. Did it, did it bother the priests at all that they were painting a Passover scene? I'm sure it did. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well. Uh, it, 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 that, that's, that's a very, very good question. And I'm, you know, I don't, I don't know what they were thinking. But Why? Uh, <laughs> okay, Mr. Marish, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Uh, the next, oh, the next artist we're going to talk about is Raphael. Raphael, look at this darling boy. I mean, he's such a sweet little thing, and he lived to be only 37 years old. But he painted the first Disney princess. The first he what? Disney princess. Princess. Disney princess? Yes, he painted the first Disney princess. Okay. He painted St. George and the Dragon, which wow. started out. Here we are. Now you see, you see the princess over there in the background. There, there she is. She's the princess. And there's St. George killing the dragon and saving the princess from evil. And actually, I've known lots of dragons in my time, and, and also lots of princesses. The, yeah. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think even I painted one of these Georgian dragon things, too, in my time. Anyway, he was a wonderful artist and painted a lot, a lot, a lot while he was alive. And actually, the poor thing died at 37 years old of exhaustion. I mean, that's how overworked he was. He actually, that's what they say. They, he actually, I read that he was actually died of exhaustion. Next, we have Donatello. Oh, here's Donatello. He looks Chinese. No, he's not Chinese. I know. <laughs> Donatello, uh, of course, Donatello is arguably one of the most influential sculptors of the early Renaissance. He lived from the late 1300s to the middle uh, of the 1400s. He was 80 years old when he died. And he produced many, many masterworks. Vasari claimed that Donatello was agnostic and uh, more power to him. Uh, this may account for his peculiar, as they called it, his peculiar take on the commissions that he received. They also claimed that he was cranky and short-tempered, but he was not Jewish. Uh, now, let's see. Can we look at, at some of his work? Ah, yes. This is, stands in the, it, originally, this was done for the Medici family and stood in the court of the Medici castle. And as you know, this is David standing on the head of Goliath, which I think is pretty interesting. And do we have any more of his work besides this one? Other than, oh, yes, in the crucifix. Um, the David, the, that David standing on the uh, head of Goliath is very interesting because the body of that sculpt 
sculpture is very effeminate. It, and it looks almost like a slightly pubescent, pre-pubescent young child to me. I always, it's, it's kind of scary to me anyway. Did they have a, did they, did they all have penis complexes? How do I know? I'm not a boy. No, all those artists. You, they, you, you address this for me, please. I'm uh, not an art expert. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you have to be an art expert to talk about penises. <laughs> I guess that's true. <laughs> and and P.S. I couldn't care less. <laughs> okay, pass on that. <laughs> Uh, okay, our next artist is really, really interesting. Can we have the slide of our next artist, Hieronymus? Piranha? That's Her a... No, no, no. Hieronymus. Oh. Hieronymus. Where is, where is our slide of Hieronymus? Ah, uh, there's Hieronymus. Is that the guy Bosch was named after, Hieronymus Bosch? That's his name, Hieronymus Bosch. Oh. Now, here is another photograph of Hieronymus and his buddy, Kermit. Now, yeah, they, they look alike. Thinking, they do a bit, don't they? I was thinking if Hieronymus and Kermit were at a cocktail party, the conversation would go something like this. Is Kermit says to Hieronymus, is that your name really, Hieronymus? And Hieronymus says, well, what's your name? And he goes, well, my name is Kermit. And he says, oh, Kermit the Frog? He says, and Kermit says, yes. And Kermit says, well, aren't you the artist, Hieronymus Bosch, that painted those people in a pond with one of them on his hands and knees with a flower growing out of his anus. And <laughs> says to Kermit, well, aren't you the one who sleeps with a pig? <laughs> so, you know, things haven't really changed much. So uh, if we can have the slide of the Garden of Earthly Delights, as you can see here, and I hope that's taking up uh, I hope it's large enough so everyone can see it. It's, uh, of course, this it was supposedly supposed to be an altarpiece. It's a triptych. But it was never put in a church anywhere. And if you can see it, it's easy to understand why, because... Too racy. Well, I think that, but, but seriously, I think this is what was going on in the medieval, in the 1400, what was going on in the psyche of people. I mean, they were, you know, and remember uh, the, Guten, the Gutenberg press was either not invented yet or had just been invented. It was invented in 1440. Uh, this painting, P.S., by the way, was painted on for 20 years. And the whole Bosch family helped paint this altarpiece. The uh, altarpieces are to be read from left to right. So here you see, we Think, but we don't know that much about this painting or the guy who painted it. But we think that it probably uh, the Garden of Earthly Delights is the, you know, the gifts given to man and his nature on the first on the far left, then what man chose to do with these gifts, and then on the right, how he has to pay for what he did. Some things never change. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you if you really look at this painting, you should. If whoever is watching this show, 
if you have never seen this painting before, and I can't imagine that you haven't, but even if you have, pull it up on your computer, on Google, and take a look at it because it's astonishing. I mean, you cannot believe what's going on in there. And I have got to tell you, no, you, well, you, you. <laughs> anyway, um, it was done between 1490 and 1510. So that's the period of time it took to paint this painting. It was oil, it was painted in oils and uh, probably was commissioned by a lay person. They think that the, the church just won't own up to this. So it never got to be used as a, um, as an altarpiece. Okay, can we have Titian? There, there we are, there's Titian. Titian was a wonderful, magical painter. He is extraordinarily popular because there are endless ways of looking at his work. Titian was called, and is even in his time, uh, the wonder of the world. He picked up his brushes and took us to places where love, lust, haplessness, vengeance, humiliation, fear, and bravery were all at their most intense. This man painted emotions at their height. He, as you can see, he's got, here's a fellow with a snake wrapped around him. How scary looking is that? Uh, he had a, and people floating through the air and people making love and all of it, everything. So he is one of the most famous painters in the world, uh, as he should be. Oh, now we're gonna go to Brunelleschi. I love a Brunelleschi. Brunelleschi was the founding father of the of Renaissance architecture. Brunelleschi was able after it had been domeless, he was able to complete the Duomo dome by inventing machinery that would help the craftsman complete it. He, uh, let me see. Okay, he put, he also left, oh, another interesting thing about that dome is they left the dome open for 129 years. They had built the entire church earlier at that earlier date, but they intentionally left where the dome was to be open because they knew that in time, the in inventors would come up with how to complete the dome. And sure enough, they did. And that dome, as you could see in the opening shot, ah, there it is. This dome stands in Florence today. Um, also, Runeletsky did a lot about putting linear perspective in paintings. In other words, he helped us art, he helped us artists by showing us how to bring you into a painting and fool your eye into thinking it's not just a piece of flat paper or a piece of flat con uh, canvas. Did the Duomo uh, in interior have paintings inside of it? Like, like the Sistine Chapel? 
Oh, I'm sure it does. I, uh, I'm sure it does. There, one of those chapels, and I'm not sure if this one has it, has the life of uh, St. Francis of Assisi in it. I'm not sure if this is the chapel, but one of them does. Uh, but I can research and I'll let you know next time. I don't know the answer to that. Um, and as soon as Brunelleschi came up with these inventions and techniques uh, that he employed, remember these were all studios. So these artisans that worked with the masters picked up all of this stuff. And if they were working with, say, with Brunelleschi in Florence and they were finished, off would go the artisan and he'd work with somebody in Belgium and tell them how Brunelleschi came up with this way of doing perspective. And then they would pick it up. So it was like a traveling, you know, the information traveled all around Europe. And P.S., by the way, that uh, I have used Brunelleschi's perspective methods in my, my own paintings. And I have, I have one that actually, uh, Bob, you have seen the painting of Lamb Chop uh, with the checked floor. That's a Brunelleschi right there. So I wasn't looking at the floor. I know it is. <laughs> OK. Now we're going to talk about Dura. Dura with a odd spelling of his name, which is B U with the two dots above it, R E R, but it's pronounced Dura. Uh, Dura, oh yes, there's Dura. Dura was a very interesting fellow. Again, he was rather short lived because. He lived only to be 56 years old, but, um, you know, maybe that, I think that might have been the norm in those days. He was born in Germany. He was um, pretty- It's like a cross-dresser. Well, he may have been. <laughs> what do you think is Jeff Chandler? Uh, uh, Dura was born in Germany and he was very arrogant because he believed himself to be a part of God because he also was a creator. So he didn't, you know, he was a very arrogant fellow and uh, an elitist and uh, I don't know if he had very many friends. Hey. Yeah. Uh, remember, uh, Europeans also, there was a great movement in Europe that, that the world was going to end in 1500. Or pardon me, Dura was born in 1471. So he probably created a bunch of that. And be, in connection with that, he created a bunch of woodcuts that depicted the revelations and the world coming to an end and all of this business. The, and of course, he, it became very, very popular because now Gutenberg comes in with the printing press. This was our first Xerox machine. So these woodcuts could be published very easily. They became very, very popular. And by 1600, millions of books had been printed and were in circulation and the libraries started to become popular. But museums and libraries and 
schools were all mixed up together. They were places that grew up and the populace called them the places of curiosities because books were new, art was new, paintings that these oil paintings that were so wonderful and realistic were new. Uh, also, the schools, they had schools in these museums. So museums housed a lot of different activities. The Uffizi in Florence, which was built by the Medici family, still today houses possibly the most important art school in the world. This is 700 years later because this is the school that the master that I painted with for 10 years was educated. She was, edu she was educated at, the, at Florence Academy in the Uffizi. So that's, that's a long time. And we're still today using many of those same methods, many of those materials. And interestingly enough, I'm gonna tell you a little story about that. I'm gonna tell you about the history of oil paints. Before oils, most painting was done with tempera. This required eggs in its mixture, which made a lot of stinky smells in the studios, which led to a lot of low rent joking about smells. Van Eyck, a Dutch painter who was around in the 1400s, refined painting using linseed oil, pigments, and at that time, there was something called rabbit glue, which was actually dead rabbit uh, and was used in the process of that. Then came out of mixing oils with pigments, methods, brand new methods of painting, which were not possible with tempera paints, such as fat over lean, which means, I know a lot of people have heard that, you always wonder, well, what does that mean, fat over lean? It just means that every oil painting that a serious painter, or classical, not a serious, a classical painter tries to do is done with layer up on layer up on layer of glazes. Usually with my portraits that I do, there'll be, I'd say, an average of six layers of, of paint. And what this does is because the more you know about how to glaze and what mixtures to create to mix in the glazes, to make the colors that you desire out of these glazes. The more depth, the more sparkle, the more beauty, and the more authenticity the, the painting has. And especially if you're a portrait painter, which I've chosen to be, and uh, portrait painting is profoundly affected by glazes. And then when that's the lean, so then, you say, they say fat over lean is the rule. Well, then if you want them to put a thicker, more opaque paint on, that's when you put it on is after the lean, after the lean layers. So that's fat over lean. Uh, also, there is something called uh, ground up glass which we still use today 
to create depth and brilliance in mainly in portraits, and I, I use it. Oil paint. With oil paint, we could now create perspective, proportion. In other words, if you remember when we looked at the Giotto art, uh, the, uh, the small, the people who were not as important were painted smaller, like little dolls standing next to the larger central figures, like Mary. And um, the paintings could be done with, with, no, forget that, I don't want to tell you that. Uh, photography and computers, I want to talk about photography and computers. They will never ever replace painting. The reason being is synthetics and uh, polymers, which are synthetics, are used to create photography and computer color. They're not organic, they're not real. And oil paint is mixed with real pigment. In most cases, there are only a few that are synthetics because of the toxicity. But now we use uh, real pigment, real oil, and still after all these years. And the reason that's so important is because we can, we create one of a kind organically. And even if you get a print, which I've done many times, I have my work printed, you still don't get the real thing. It still does not look like a real painting. If you were to put a, a, a print of one of my paintings up, and the real painting next to it, in one second you would see the difference because the real painting is organic, the other painting is synthetic. And the organic painting with a number of glazes, each time the color is different, it's unique. Um, now, uh, I'm going to close the show uh, with some Michelangelo or Michelangelo was not just a sculptor or a painter. He was a, a poet as well. I don't know if a lot of people know him as a poet, but he was. And he was a really a rock star of his time. People were just worshiped him. He began sculpting, as I told you, at the age of 14. And he even lived with the Medici family for a few years when he was young. When he died, Rome buried him. They would not, but at the request of the Medici family in Florence, uh, they requested that, that Rome return his body. He died in Rome, but they wouldn't do it. So they went in and stole his body. So his body, his corpse was stolen from Rome and now is buried in the chapel in Florence. Uh, Miko also wrote poetry. And this is the poetry of Michelangelo. A heart of flaming sulfur, a soul without a guide to tame the flaming will, the ruffling pride of fierce desires from which these passions flow. If I was made for art from childhood, I am prey for beauty to devour. I blame the mistress. 
I was born to serve. Now, interesting, this is a, how most artists feel. This is why most artists wonder what people mean when they walk up to you and you're slaving away and you're pouring out your quart of blood onto the easel. And they say, oh, you must be having, that looks like fun. You must be having fun. Um, it's the only, it, 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 it's, it's not fun, guys. It's not. It's more than that. Painting is, painting is like religion. It's like a religion. And I don't believe in religions, but I believe in painting. And that's really all I have to say for today, Mr. Mirish. Thank you. Thank you. you. You enlightened us about the Enlightenment. Oh, no, that's a different era. <laughs> I'll do that, that, do that next month. <laughs> OK. Thank you. That was very, very interesting and very fact build and and uh i'm sure we all learned a lot from it i hope so I, oh, there's amy uh, so amy what are, what do you have to say i really enjoyed it good i want to hear more about art as a religion oh well it is it it, it truly Art as a religion. Uh, For those I, who can do it. Well, I can tell you why. It's, it's that. Art is a religion because you are the creator. And that makes for making a big scoop out of the insides of you. And I think that probably someday in our brains, they're gonna find that there's that art part, which is right here. And right next to it might be a religion part. And I think sometimes they go back and forth. <laughs> I don't know, but, but it does, it does make you feel like you know what's going on and why we're here. It really is a profound profession. And I get it that these guys in the Renaissance, I mean, this was all new to them. And they got in front of these, these frescoes and these walls and these chapels, and they were told these mythical, magical stories. And they thought, and they believed them. And then they gave them money to paint these stories. And that was really good because they could eat. <laughs> so it, it, it's all wound up together. And believe it or not, I believe it is today. That's, you know, I don't, who am I? Nobody, and not, I know nothing, but I'm just telling you how I feel. Mr. Marish? Oh, I, I will never experience that because I don't anticipate my undertaking doing painting. Oh, really? Okay, well, then never mind. <laughs> you never maybe, know, Bob. Maybe that, maybe that applies to other forms of creation. Oh, indeed. I know it. Uh, as, I, as I said yesterday, I was married to a writer for 50 years. And um, he definitely experienced this and definitely went through profound emotions to it. To take on any job that requires original thought or creativity puts you on the line. You know, that's, that's it. What, you know, that, that you got to do that and we don't move forward. Very good. Thank you both. Uh, Aline. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you.